Welcome, my beautiful human beings and family and friends. My name is Chance, and you're listening to Interverse Podcast. This is Season 3, Episode 15, and it's kind of a different episode today. Uh, I just got back from Darkening of the Sun Festival, where the eclipse happened, and lots of other crazy stuff happened, but we were right in the direct path of the total eclipse up there. And just about all my best friends in the world were at that place, and it was a really cool time. Really grateful for everybody that was involved in putting that together and holding space, um, creating such a beautiful environment for us to go through the transition period that the eclipse was representing to so many of us. So uh, thanks for listening, and... In this episode, we're going to just jump between a couple of conversations that I had with different people. So I'll just introduce those as we go to them. And I'll say I met a lot of beautiful people, had a really wonderful time, and I hope to go back to more events on that land. And I do feel like something special happened there with everybody during the actual eclipse. I'd also like to ask everybody to check out the episode notes or go to interversepodcast.com and check out the links to Patreon where you can support this show and get rewards in, in return and help me get the equipment that I need and expand this here vehicle for cosmically enlightening conversations. At least that's what I hope that it is. Okay, well, I love you guys. We're going to start out with a quick chat that I had with my buddy Kurt where actually I just asked him to retell a story that he was just telling me and I had to get on the mic. Of course it involves UFOs. Actually, two of the segments of this episode are going to involve UFOs. So first, let's talk to Kurt here. So at Highbury, it was the last night, right after you left, the storm that was supposed to hit us really hard started to go around the mountain like the one the night previous had went around the other side. But it kind of like froze on the back side of the mountain towards Eureka Springs. And as we were, Jordan I actually is the one that drew attention to these weird lights that were over the hill. And in the same place, there was a red light on this side and a green light on this side. And they were kind of dim at first, and they would go one after the other, and each time they would go, lightning would strike into the lights. And it was doing this consecutively for probably 20 minutes into the lights, and each time the red light and the green light would get brighter and brighter. And at a certain point, at the peak, at the climax of this whole thing, in the middle, like in between where all this craziness was going on, where lightning was striking, in the same place twice, a lot, in the very middle there was this like big orange like fiery explosion type light that was just like boom 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 like nine or ten times and each time it boomed lightning was going just like instantly into the middle of it and throughout this whole process we're standing there and there was a couple of us you know under the influence of catalysts you know so we were wondering if maybe we were just seeing you know a higher level of this storm that you know typically we weren't seeing or something like that but we started pulling other people in that were walking by and be like hey like turn around look over there and you know there's this one older gentleman that we pulled in and he's like he turns around and he's like oh my god like I've never seen anything like this before in my life he's like what's happening in the sky right now I'm so grateful that you guys stopped me for this because this is amazing you know and he was probably late 50s early 60s you know he'd seen a lot of storms in his life and he was just like what is going on like it was amazing, man. And, and nobody had a camera phone on because it's a no, festival. Right. No one carries that shit. Right. And it was in the middle of a rainstorm, so everyone's scrambling around throwing all their stuff into no the vehicle. No one's got cameras out because the, right. the rain is happening. Right. You know? So it's just like how... They always seem to like reveal themselves when there's no capability of it being proven other than to the people who experience it. Right. And you can't experience it, I guess, if you're not in the present moment anyway. You yeah. Know, if you're stuck in your phone, like those types of things might, might not even happen. You know, I mean, they're happening, but... The perceiver is not perceiving them. They're happening. Everything that's happening is happening in consciousness, right. and it's only an experience in consciousness. So if you're tuned into the experience of your phone, you might not be able to experience something happening around you. Right. Yeah, that's true. I better remember that when I'm carrying around this stuff. Maybe I right. prevent secretities. Right, right. Or maybe I'm the well, one who's going to get I'll Bigfoot say on camera. that I notice right now you're not standing behind your camera. A lot of people do that. They hide behind <laughs> it. You're kind of wielding it as a tool. 
Yeah. Not a, not a shield. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to have this GoPro for that reason. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Uh, well, thanks for telling me the story, Kurt. Yeah, uh, no problem, man. That's a crazy one. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> awesome. Fringe stuff. Unexplainable stuff. Okay, so I'm here with Steven and Amber who I've been camping with at the family campgrounds and we've seen some weird shit in the sky, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first thing we saw was basically what you, some kind of UFO and if you hear that, uh, that's their, their wonderful child Hazel trying to tell you guys what happened in her language but it's probably unintelligible yeah so okay explain these ufos real quick they're really really small so they're not like your typical ufo idea in that it's not like it doesn't look like it's um, a spacecraft or something right it looked more like a bubble it looked more like a bubble a plate well the closer it was the more transparent and bubble like it was it was like flowy like yeah floating on the wind the <clears> further away it looked more like white like solid yeah that's kind of how i thought too it looked like a bubble at first but then it got more and more white but uh what was weird is it moved really fast what happened was that there was a like a cluster of three of them all together right and they um i saw them basically split apart from each other and become three separate ones. And there was one that was down by my car, uh, just like 25 feet from us. Right. And it flew up and z they all zoomed around. Like they were moving way faster they, than- They were moving as if it was a plastic bag being blown in the wind. But no, but way quicker though. Way quicker, but I mean, that's the movement. It was all zigzag. Yeah, the, the pattern looked, looked random like that. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. But then when they got out in the distance there, I mean, you saw the two fall, right? It looked like it, it was either going like super fast out of the horizon or it was dropping. It looked like it straight, two of them dropped out of the air to the ground. They either dropped or they crossed the horizon from going really far away. Right. And when they did that, that was extremely fast. But another weird thing about them that's really hard to describe is that even though you could tell they're getting further away, it looked like their relative size stayed the same in your vision. Right. Do you know what I mean by that? You know, I mean, to me, it really did look like a sheet of paper. Uh, that's what it looked like, a sheet of white paper. But, but it's like, okay, when something's a certain size. distance from you, it's one size. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, like, that's what it was, though. It was like, it looked like it was about the size of a plate or something, like you said. But then when it got to the point where it's about to go over the trees way further away, it it's still the looked the size. same size in the sky. Yeah. yeah. So that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> it's a quite an optical illusion something there's four of them well it was really strange because i just saw the one and then i saw it and i got your attention and then i lost sight of it and then one turned into three and then there was a fourth one and then i saw two of them drop out of the sky i don't know what happened to the other two but it was a pretty strange appearance yeah it got me pretty excited um well how it was so small and it was going one direction it completely changed direction like so it was definitely felt like it was a, a piloty or I don't it's hard to hard to know like it, it, it was, was so small was so like what was piloting it it right. was more like it was almost like a little orb of energy more or like a some kind of like weird spirit thing more than uh, it was a UFO and a traditional like aliens or secret military craft type idea the only thing I could think of it was some kind of weird drone but it was they were perfect spheres so mm -hmm. I don't really think that's what was going on very interesting. So the other thing that happened was, um, and this has actually happened a couple times over the weekend, but it was way more apparent this time. Huge clouds were coming towards us. A giant wall of clouds, like one of those National Geographic cover photos where it's literally like a two mile long storm front of one giant thunderhead cloud, right? Heading our way. And uh, then it just split in half. It just as it approached us. It just split in half. And yeah, the sky is completely clear now. Completely clear. Completely clear. It literally split in half. The two halves went off to other directions of the campgrounds and disintegrated as they went off. And that is definitely at least the third time that's happened this weekend. Yeah, it's happened every night actually that there was about to be a storm and then it didn't happen. And 
Well, a great thing that happened though this morning was there were storm clouds that never actually stormed on us that came in just at dawn to keep the uh, sun um, uh, you know, clouded and people could sleep in longer. Right, and then it went away. Because I woke up and I thought it was gonna rain. I was convinced that it was gonna rain. And then, just like this time, it completely just dissipated, pushed away. I was pretty impressed by that one this morning. I've heard the native elders are even gathering together and chanting or meditating for right. the storms to That's what I heard too. N not mess up the festival. And I personally participated in meditating for that, for a uh, non-stormy outcome. And I guess um, all of our thoughts combined really made, made a difference because I've never seen weather behave that way and I've never seen little white sphere bubble UFOs. So it's a pretty cool day. <laughs> and that's not even all the stuff we did. So, yeah, I had darkening of the sun. Um, gonna see an eclipse tomorrow. So, you know, in case the zombie apocalypse really does happen, then I guess you may never hear this recording, but otherwise I'll get it out there. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, man. Anything else you want to describe about the weirdness today? I think we pretty much, pretty much covered the whole thing. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm here with uh, Nathan Crabtree, fellow podcaster, host of Nathan's Freedom Zone. Um, wanted to just ask you about what kind of stuff you've been up to, what you've learned this festival, what it's been like, um, what have you observed, you know, just uh, what do you think? Well, I'm definitely glad I went. I haven't been to a festival in about a year, and I just got busy with worldly duties, so... I'm going to get more into them, though, in the future, but what I got out of it, I got a whole ton of uh, exercise out of it, first of all, because I walked around with a backpack full of organite, and I actually found a strategy of gaining energy and having very good interactions at uh, festivals. What I do now, I just figured this out yesterday, I walk around the perimeter of the property, which there's a pretty large property here, and there's a bunch of different camping locations. It's very beautiful property. And I just walk around it endlessly, and that's sort of my default behavior until somebody interacts with me or until I see something that I want to, you know, grab someone's attention or something. And uh, I'll have a short interaction or a, or a longer one with them. Like, uh, I just found Chance here on my infinite loop, and then we got into talking. Deselenited me, or he selenited me to get me, you know, my energy fixed up. It was really nice. So uh, that's mainly what I've got out of it. It's a whole bunch of exercise physically, and uh, I did a little bit of shadow work the other night, which was really nice. But it was actually short and sweet. The shadow work. It was uh, intense, kind of uh, depressive a little bit, but it was over in a few hours. And then I did a little bit the next day, and then the rest of it was just really awesome time. I've seen a, a whole lot of friends that uh, I see here and there. A lot of the Native American community has been here and I, I've made some new friends and I'm sure, uh, you know, it's just, why not go to something like this, right? Well, it's a once in a lifetime thing to have a solar eclipse in this area this year at this time. I mean, I guess every moment is once in a lifetime, right? And so is every festival because even if they throw it in the same place at the same time, it's never going to be that same mix of people, that same mix of music, those same uh, creators, and the same vibes coming through. And we've experienced uh, a really high energy experience, I guess, all, all together, everybody here, um, together in the same sort of uh, realizing that we're all connected. And I'm seeing everybody just be so uplifting and encouraging to one another and um, I, I've i seen more kids at this festival than at any festival I've ever been to and uh, I guess you know part of that is because like I was saying it's this eclipse coming up and it drew a lot of people but um, ultimately I think that people are ready for a change in the way that they interact with each other and they're, they're ready to find a way to um, become a better version of themselves outside of the festival world so that we can make that real world, as we call it, but it's kind of more like the fake matrix, uh, more like what it's like to be in that flow of synchronicity that you can create whenever you just follow and walk your own path, literally as you do, walking 
specifically your own path, creating your own uh, flow and still finding yourself in synchronistic uh, relation to everyone else. And as for the shadow work, I've definitely experienced that in my time so far the last couple of days. Uh, for me, it's manifested not in uh, negative emotions, but actually a lot of a lot of experiences where whatever I'm trying to do gets opposed by some stupid um, carelessness on my part. Basically, a lot of short but painful but non-damaging reminders to be more present. And whenever I kind of lose my uh, focus on, you know, the present moment too much this entire weekend, I'll walk into something or uh, pinch myself on something or spill something or whatever. But Again, like none of it's actually been anything serious, but they've come in these sort of spurts of anti-synchronicity, anti-synchronicity where I have several of them happen in a chain reaction. And it's almost like uh, the field is trying to get me to polarize and testing me, but every time I just laugh at it um, when the chain reactions happen and they do clear up. And then, like I said, no harm done, no harm, no foul, which is what I always assume going into it. So, uh, yeah, we each, you know, have our own way of experiencing the... Um, the cycling of energy at a place like this because there is always an up and down to things uh, but it's you know it's too bad that I'm going to be seeing you leave before we have the big eclipse party you're um, going down for ceremony right yeah yep peyote ceremony uh, which is going to be awesome I I got a whole lot out of the vibes here and I find if I just go to a completely separate event and completely fresh new energy that'll probably end up being amazing too although it won't be in the direct line of the eclipse or anything it's very perceptive of you noticing all the little anti-synchronicities i like that term of where the spirit is sort of reminding you you know maybe that you're uh, anticipating the future and not being present is a lot of it i've, well, I've usually it was a thought Usually it was um, some kind of thought would be coming up that was making me slightly worried or afraid, and then I would have, like, some little thing happen and I'd get hurt. And it was like Spirit saying, if you are afraid, you'll get hurt. If, you're not af if there's nothing to be afraid of because you're doing the right thing and you're present, then you won't get hurt. <laughs> yeah, because the fear is kind of a distraction. And another old distraction that I had was chasing the dragon, which is where you look for happiness and fulfillment in stuff that's external to you. And I was always looking for uh, fulfillment in girls and relationships and things like that. And an environment like this, before I stopped chasing the dragon, this would have been like the perfect environment to chase the dragon and never ever be happy. And it used to just make me miserable because I would be looking for something and never find it. But what I did this time and what I've been learning to do over the last year with all the ceremonies is to just be present and enjoy what I have in the moment because that's all there is anyway and not look for happiness external to myself and just sort of play and you know that's why I did all the walking with a I actually brought a heavy backpack yeah so to make it extra fun full of organite that's a lot of energy though yeah full of organite and um so I did a lot of walking because I don't know it just burns your legs a little bit and your feet start hurting I kind of like it I kind of get off on that type of thing <laughs> um, well to each their own actually no I've done a lot of walking this festival too and I mean there's a huge hill on these campgrounds that you have to take to get to where the um, native uh, domes are at the four direction domes but it's something that we are actually supposed to be strong and good at like humans are supposed to be able to walk around and carry a heavy pack for long distances. That's actually like our birthright to have that ability. And there's something um, that gets you circulating in a really good way whenever you are circulating around that much in a, in a day. And for you carrying that much organite, like kind of like you were saying, you're sort of stirring up the energy in a spiral around the entire campground because uh, that backpack is full of high vibrational material. Who knows what kind of interaction all of them in one, sp you know, it might be more effective to create some kind of grid network around the place in a circle with the organites instead of but maybe the motion is more effective I don't really know <laughs> uh, this is kind of unnecessary bro science speculation but um, I do hope that you have a good time at the event and Ava uh, a good time in that uh, your time is spent towards the service of your greatest good <laughs> and that the, uh, the medicine is 
exactly the strength it needs to be and that the eclipse is the return of the eternal summer and uh, the sun and light of your own heart igniting and finding a balanced equilibrium with your external world so that you always shine upon it without any um, without a dismal day <laughs> I think that's what we're all here to, to achieve in this uh, solar eclipse actually Nathan I think we're all here to flip that switch internally and actually become unconditional love uh, shiners I guess suns to our own universes when we go forth from from here um, and if we can achieve that then we're gonna we're gonna be okay in this world we will defeat the darkness and we will <laughs> achieve the equilibrium that is so missing oh it's funny that you say defeat the darkness because me and Paul Four Eagles had a discussion about this a long time last night about the darkness not actually being the same thing as evil but there's a weird misnomer that's oh, gotten yeah. into people's subconscious where whenever they talk about something negative or evil they're talking about they use the word darkness which no, is I meant evil I did mean evil you're right yeah, so I'm going to start correcting people only because it gives you another chance to do the great work and, and, and help. <laughs> and also, I think it gets in the subconscious. Well, equilibrium means light and dark and balance. So that's, uh, you know, I was talking about equilibrium and then incorrectly using the word darkness. So I'm glad you pointed that out. It helps me because we create our own fake matrix prison through our linguistic sloppiness. <laughs> yeah, the, the weird word habits that people have actually get in the collective subconscious and it can cause people to act in weird ways like the darkness might actually be the feminine aspect of consciousness and the light the masculine I've heard it described that way the receptive the receptive and the one that puts it in <laughs> yeah and they're both kinda play a role you know in, in exchanging the energy in an infinite Taurus but uh, I've maybe said this before but I'm gonna say it again the universe is a blank canvas that uh, is written on with black ink and then once it's entirely full with stories the, uh, and completely black, then they st we start writing on it with white until it's completely white again. And it just goes back and forth in this uh, oscillation. That's a really good way to put it. I kind of learned this sort of theory from Walter Russell and the book The Secret of Light. He had a bunch of hand-drawn illustrations showing the feminine actually in his book was a black box and the masculine was in the corners, these little tiny condensed balls that are in the corners of each of the box. And then energy will go back and forth between the, the masculine corners, which are like a mirror reflection of each other. And it was very weird. They would take sine waves going through the black space in between and very interesting. Part of the main reason why I go to um, ceremonies and why I go to events like this is to do the internal work and to become more focused so that I can be more effective in the external world and do take care of worldly duties and also do the great work. And also this is a really good opportunity to work with people one-on-one -on -one and to really hash out uh, problems. Like last night before I was talking to Four Eagles, we got into the this uh, rabbit hole of conversation that started with me bringing up the police state to a couple of people and they were a little bit um, skeptical and they weren't sure of whether or not you know the police state is a problem or if it's all kind of relative and doesn't even matter and they and oh, it means that they still have an internal submission to authority externally yeah and we even had a discussion about whether or not truth is actually real and they seem to be of the opinion that it's not real but then I was like well is that statement an example of you know something that's not actually true what's because up, there is no truth and it, it went yeah what's up dude what's up yeah i love that I, yeah we're recording uh what do you what are you up to man what's your name oh <laughs> no yeah no we don't <laughs> uh, f uh fellow camp camper asking for ecstasy but uh i use that all the time nathan whenever that statement to try to argue some sense into people that are completely lost in the illusion of solipsism, which is the idea that there's no such thing as truth. Of course, if you say that, then you're saying something that is not true. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> self-contradictory statement. The statement there is no truth also applies to itself, which is saying that it's not a true statement. And so therefore, it's like a logical just 
nonsense. The, in, way to the, the inverse is true too. If you say there is truth, no, that statement's true, and it reinforces itself. See, yeah, it's very obvious when you think about it that way. I think the correct answer is uh, pretty pretty obvious. But uh, I also, in an art piece that I started this weekend, I actually put in the phrase in really big letters: "Truth exists." Find it. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, yeah, your art is getting more and more conscious, I'm sure. I haven't seen all of your history of art, but it seems to be pretty highly conscious stuff. This has been a really wonderful vibe here. There hasn't been any problems or even toxic people that I've seen. Like, you, I haven't seen any obvious, you know, super drunk people stumbling yeah, around. And I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't seen anyone fighting, and I haven't seen people you know yelling at each other it's just been super peaceful and i think i saw one cop drive through here but he was probably quickly realized he was like oh there's no reason for me to be here <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it's nice and chill out here i'm sure that i've seen a few people that were what you would call a little too far intoxicated um actually at the consciousness jam last night I think that we witnessed somebody that was experienced being spirit possession uh, that was part of the jam, and not that there was anything um, in a serious way wrong with her, but you could tell that something had come in and was coming through her and that she wasn't really home. And whatever it was seemed benevolent, and it seemed to just be interested in dancing and chanting with everybody, and it didn't have a lot of uh, diversity in what it wanted to say, but it was very, it was still very interesting. It was. Um, you know, and this is just a theory. It might not be that this person was experiencing a form of spirit possession, but I think that we have a very dim understanding of what that even means or what it even means to be in one state of consciousness versus an altered state of consciousness. What do you think? Yeah, that's entirely possible. I sort of missed... I'm sure I saw what it, the person you were talking about. I don't know exactly which one it was, but you could view it as spirit possession instead of being a binary on-off switch. You could view it as, like, the law of polarity or something where you can be spirit possessed to a certain degree and that means that sometimes the spirit will come through and it'll come in here and there intermittently and uh, other times you know a different spirit might come in or you maybe it's just you expressing yourself well it could be um, so demonic consciousness is actually etymologically like demonic spirits what demonic means etymologically is uh, divided dim Demonic. It's saying like two, making two out of one uh, is actually the, is from what I understand. So what's, what is below us in consciousness is a chasm, a division, our legs, you understand? And what's above us in consciousness is unity, the crown, sovereignty, uh, oneness, oneness. So any kind of thing that comes through that um, is a benevolent higher spirit, is actually just channeling the energy of the one teacher or the one creator uh, through itself. And maybe it does have some type of uh, individuated nature because it's not completely connected to source. I think we're probably looking at beings that are less divided when we're talking about spirits of a higher vibrational nature. That's my theory. Yeah, and in that Walter Russell book with the uh, black square and the tight white balls, they he talks about the dualism and the two colors being express the expressions of the source like the thinking of God is sort of what he calls it and whenever God thinks it's always in two colors and it's always sort of separated or something but the source itself is the unified stillness of eternal presence or something so it, all, it might be like while we're in this universe you should we should just accept that we're separate to a degree and we're also unified to a degree yeah. and that they're both sort of paradoxically true you just, I don't know that takes a long time and a lot of thinking and a, probably some plant medicine would help figure that one out but it's a really good dynamic actually because if you do manage to create a balance or equilibrium between existence and non-existence like we're uh, talking about in this physical plane that we're here in right now you've got uh, the advantage of being able to have experiences but also the advantage of none of it uh, having any real um, consequence to you in the long run there's basically nothing even if you decide to have the experience of um, extreme separation or extreme pain and uh, uh, you know trauma even all of that is illusory enough 
to be completely wiped away at some point in the you know in the future of your experience so there's really there's really nothing to fear fear is com is completely able to be you know cleaned up the res the consequences are able to be dispelled anything that is what we would call evil can be restored to harmony with at least time and attention. I think it probably requires at least the attention thing. Yeah, that's the universal process of forgiveness, and it involves changing your mind, first of all, and changing your emotions and changing your behaviors. That's when you're really on the path to forgiving and overcoming the setbacks and erasing the karma. And I think over the course of uh, infinity, the spirit really can restore all past damages and heal everything. You know, it might not be in this lifetime, or it might. Who knows? But uh, I did learn a secret to doing shadow work, another perspective on it, because I was talking to a friend about shadow work that I was doing, and what he described was there's like... A monkey, right? It's the evil monkey in your head that is telling you negative things that you can't do this and you're not good enough and that you hate yourself and, and you'll never get what you want. And it's almost like this monkey has a, a chain with a box on it and it hits you it hits you with this box chain, which could represent a prison. It hits you with it and then every time it hits you you have one of these negative thoughts that, that the the monkey's generating, which is by an aspect of maybe your own thinking, but he told me a good way to overcome the, that type of thinking and because I was really working on it with my shadow work. And he said what you should do is if you take like a, uh, one of the things the monkey always says, like, uh, I'm a loser, maybe a good example. You just take that and you say, well, if that is true that I'm a loser, what is something that is still positive that is true about the situation? Like, we'll say, I'm a loser, but... There's people who are more losers than I am. <laughs> or, <laughs> see, and it makes you laugh, and you're like, okay, I feel a little better about it. And then he, he had a few more steps. He said, do that. Uh, first, write down what the monkey is saying so that you can figure out exactly what you need to work on. You just listen to your thoughts and then pay attention and maybe write one, one of them down. Then think of a positive thing that is also true in spite of that. Like, if I'm never going to get what I want, well, if that's true, then I, I, I guess I can just forget about it, you know, and I'll worry about something else because I'm obviously not going to get that, so I'll just forget you know, about it. There are always such ridiculous, ridiculous uh, blanket statements that can't be supported by any reality that the monkey mind throws at you. And that's the funny thing about it is that the statements uh, on their face are obviously not true, but you're entertaining them. And you're saying, if it was true, well, what is something positive if it was true? And then it, somehow it, makes, it takes power away from the statement. Yeah, um, what I would add to what you're saying is that you don't even have to look at it like an evil monkey. The mind, I can even conceive of it, um, thanks to someone that was on my podcast re recently giving me uh, some ideas on this, actually, Richard Sachs from Lost Arts Radio. Um, looking at the mind, the monkey mind, as you're calling it, is actually being more like a kid. And he's kind of bored, and he's easily um, programmed just like kids are. I mean, you know how a 10-year-old or something will just bully the shit out of other kids around them if a group is doing it a lot of people a lot of kids that age will actually engage and be easily swayed and uh, controlled in that way you can look at it like a kid that's kind of uh, become a little heartless because your mind is you know our minds are not in equilibrium with our hearts the way that they need to be currently right now I mean that's the 23 degree shift in the earth's uh, tilt in the earth's axis it's the imbalance you know that's been going on for quite some time that we've been working to correct in this um, in this upcoming age that you know it is being corrected in. Uh, but that mind can be instead of uh, your you know your bully that's following you around and telling you you suck. Uh, you can actually, like you were talking about, to think about something that's good. You can you can give it a task to focus on. You can give it an assignment. You can say to the mind, okay, every time this kind of a thought comes up, you're going to replace it with uh, a positive thought. And you don't even have to do the writing down part. And your mind, w your mind is really good at games and likes games. And if you treat it like it's just a game and like you want to get as many points as you can, you want to catch as many negative thoughts and turn them into something intentional uh, as you can, then your mind will do it automatically. And you'll start doing something like, for me it happens with being judgmental of other people. Uh, 
I'll see somebody and just be like, oh shit, they don't look healthy. And I'll have some judgmental thought like that. And uh, it used to be that I'd have them all the time and I'd get down on myself because I was like, man, why are you such an asshole that your first thought when you look at some certain people is something mean and it just jumps in there. Why is that happening? And I actually did this exact thing. I started, and this is a long time ago. I've been now practicing this behavior. But like when I hear some kind of judgmental thought pop up in my head, like what we're describing, I just immediately override it and go, I love you. I think that to the person. I don't say it necessarily, but I just think, I love that person. There's nothing wrong with them. So um, the way that thoughts and words work is uh, they have a vibrational energy that goes on and out of you um, and expands until it can find something in the physical and bring that back to you to match that vibrational energy that you put out there. So if you... Uh, intentionally call back the thought or correct it and change it then you are changing the, the energy the nature of the energy that's going out from you so really the only thing that you have to do to stop um, situations that are reinforcing your bad thing your bad thoughts and, and therefore stop the bad thoughts is to literally just replace them and wipe them out um, negate them with something positive every time they come up and it I say that it works it does. That's doing the internal. You can also work directly on the external, and that'll feed back into the internal state. Like if, if your house is really messy or, say, your body is completely toxified, you can actually just work on the, your external environment, and that'll make it easier to have those positive thoughts. And you can also work directly on the positive thoughts. I listened to that episode with uh, Richard, and it was really uh, very good. I liked that he was saying that the uh, thoughts and the emotions are not actually you. It's sort of a weird paradox again, but like last, the other night I was doing the shadow work and I already knew that I need, needed to stop thinking those thoughts and replace them with good thoughts. I knew that uh, con conceptually and I already knew that if I did that, my emotions would improve and the external environment would improve and that I can also work on just the external environment. But something triggered me and it was like something that emotionally was very painful. And so I knew that I shouldn't go into that negative loop with the thinking, but it was so overwhelming. And this is where it comes in with the thoughts are not exactly you and you don't have full total control over them, but you actually have some amount of control. But at that point, the thoughts sort of so overwhelmed me, the negative thoughts, because it was the old thought patterns that were programmed in from years and years. And although I've been trying to overcome them, this one triggering event sort of just unleashed a floodgate of them. And I was like, okay, we'll just sit here and be negative for a few hours. And I got it out. It lasted a few hours, and it was, it was kind of intense. I did a little bit the next day, and then uh, it was over. And that's part of doing the shadow work, I think. But... The other part is to withdraw your consent from having that type of emotions and those kind of thoughts. And you can feel yourself pulling energy away from those thoughts. And that's a big, big secret of it. Because used to, I would be consciously dwelling in those thoughts and putting energy into them and amplifying them sort of on purpose. Yeah. But the switch is when you realize that that's the wrong path and then change and be like okay well i'm just if the thoughts come on their own that's one thing and and i'll, I'll do my best but i'm definitely not going to be feeding them anymore and i'm going to be you know replacing them as much as i can and it's a process but it's like the great work the internal great work and uh it's part of it so i think we're on the right path here i agree i think one thing to add that i harp on all the time but meditation is an amazing tool for cultivating the awareness to be able to notice when you're doing this instead of just getting caught up in it. And that is a big part of it. <clears throat> so um, I'll let you uh, maybe get on out of here um, since you are now looking to go drive down to uh, Sacred Way for, or New Haven for a peyote ceremony at the eclipse in the morning. So it's been good talking to you, Nathan. I'm sure we'll do it again for one of our respective podcasts pretty soon. Um, you got anything else to say, dude? Well, I definitely caught an energy bump off of you, and uh, the music, this band, I kind of really like them. I don't know, it's tempting me to stay a little bit longer. So um, That's why but, I'm trying to cut it off, because I'm like, man, this is kind of a good band. <laughs> this, is, this is really good. So uh, we'll cut it short for now, and uh, thanks for having me on again, as always. Um, love everybody, and keep up the great work. That's right. Okay, bye-bye.
So, here I am driving, well, sort of driving, you could barely call this driving, um, moving through a traffic situation on I-44, heading out, leaving from the festival. It's uh, Monday, August 21st, the day of the darkening of the sun. Haha. <laughs> so, um, I thought, I, well, since I'm stuck here anyway, and I'm thinking about all the stuff that I was doing at the festival and what happened and what I learned and experienced, I figured maybe I should just record a little bit of it and do a bit of a solo, um, solo cast here. And yeah, so here I am in this traffic and the eclipse was today and you've probably heard some of the uh, stuff that I was experiencing and other parts of the recordings that are coming up before this. I'm sure I'll put this at the end since it's at the end. But the eclipse itself, the actual the actual thing we're here to see, I guess I'll start with talking about that. Um, I joined all the family up at the top of the hill where the four direction tents were and um, there was chanting and praying and uh, drumming and shouting and cheering and it was really quite an amazing experience as the sun gradually was covered by the disk of the moon and we were all using these glasses that they were heavily pushed out and made sure everyone was made sure to have a pair and they basically make it where you can't see anything because they're so dark except if you're looking directly at the sun you can see an orange ball so they were pretty cool so you could watch the actual moon slowly covering the sun over the time that it took which was a long time I think it started at like 1148 and it didn't completely eclipse in totality until uh, 115 and one thing I noticed as the eclipse was coming on was that there were a lot of planes in the air and there were a lot of chemtrails happening and nobody else was talking about this which is pretty normal but I do know a few other people that noticed it with me, and it was just kind of bizarre. They were making these circular patterns around the uh, area that we were in, and these big clouds were jetting out from behind them and expanding over time, and it wasn't something that I was like freaked out by or afraid of, but I thought, this is something odd that we're all looking up in the sky, and yet still most people aren't noticing this. Most of the time, people don't actually spend time looking up at the sky. But anyway, I guess that's <clears throat> um, that's just what happens. We're we're getting something sprayed over us all the time, and uh, we're accepting that. And I'll go more into that later because something else occurred on that on that topic. But uh, as the sun was getting completely covered, you could just feel the energy changing, and I mean literally because it was getting less and less hot the more the sun was covered up by the moon and that was pretty welcome because we're in like the hottest part of summer in the middle of the sun being in Leo raging like a lion and everybody was definitely feeling that but it wasn't like it didn't seem to be sapping people's energy today um everyone seemed I didn't see like any gnarly sunburns it seemed like we were all doing okay with the solar power <laughs> and yeah, the weather held out to be perfect. Still no storms the entire time, which was uh, lucky because it would have been a bummer if we couldn't have seen the eclipse because of cloud coverage. Which is why I wasn't that happy about the clouds coming out of planes that suspiciously were circling our area. But anyway, um, as the sun completely slid behind the moon, uh, there was this palpable silence that just took over. Everybody became quiet and that was I think by design we were meant to be together staying grounded and holding space for everybody in the world that maybe wasn't grounded through the energy of this experience and it was palpable um, I could feel I literally could feel this tingling coming up from the bottom of my spine going up my entire body and uh, it was like I don't know how else to describe it other than a moment where you're extremely, extremely present and aware and you're so in that moment that it feels timeless in a, in a sense. And it was 
really cool to be right there in the direct path of the sun. Um, the two and a half, two minutes forty five seconds, I think, is how long it's been being completely covered. And in that time, uh, there was a child ne- uh, around me who said that she could see orange and black snakes um, around on the ground on the blankets that we were uh, sitting on and standing around, which was really interesting. Uh, it was like she was seeing some kind of ayahuasca vision this was a small child probably like five or six um so that was pretty interesting and for me everything just took on like a less solid feeling and appearance uh it's very dreamlike it was so crazy because all around you, you could see just a sunset type of uh, effect it was like there's a sunset in all directions instead of just being in one horizon and um you could see the stars really well. You could see Venus, and you could also see the damn planes that were flying around. Um, and everything was just kind of shimmery and wavy for me. Uh, it was very psychedelic and cool, and I think that really everyone was feeling that energy. I saw people crying and releasing pent-up uh, emotions and embracing each other, and all around it was just basically a feeling of awe and appreciation and presence that and groundedness that we were all together achieving um and so at the end of the the moment of the eclipse most people are looking up at this with their glasses on uh i saw a plane some sort of flying craft that had a trail coming off the back of it that had kind of a pinkish hue actually on the trail the cloud coming out from behind it the Kim trail if that's what we want to call it and just as the sun was about to come out from behind the moon on the right side at the end of the totality of the eclipse this plane flew directly in front of the eclipse and right at the moment that the sun peeked out from the other side the plane crossed that pl- that plane actually the plane, cro- <laughs> the plane crossed the plane and I intersected with the light of the sun as it was coming out. And it was really weird and then um, very distracting. Uh, and oddly enough, only one other person that was around me actually perceived it. And I think to some extent it was because people were using these sunglasses, that these extreme polarization sunglasses, and that's a fun... <laughs> Wow, that's even a funny thing to think about. They're looking at it through polarized lenses. Um, that's symbolic, I guess, on, uh, spiritually perhaps. I was also looking at it through those lenses. Um, although you didn't need the glasses anymore once the sun was actually fully covered. You could just see the corona and it was definitely wouldn't hurt your eyes. You could see it completely. But yeah, yeah, all these people were still wearing the glasses. And I suspect that with the glasses on, you wouldn't have been able to see the plane at all, nor any other damn thing be- that wasn't the direct sunlight because that's how polarized the glasses actually were so um me and my friend kurt who saw this plane we talked about it and to me what it represented i guess is that whatever is going on with this stuff uh what they're spraying what they're the bombs they're dropping on other countries the they the part of our our collective humanity that is still engaging in these uh, fear-based control practices and uh, power struggles, that part of us is uh, highly connected to money. And so even just having a job where you're paying taxes and you're um, receiving dollar bills and spending dollar bills all the time, um, that is feeding in to an extent to whatever these programs are that are running in our uh, unconscious mind that most people don't even notice, like these planes spraying stuff in the air and directly displaying what they're doing in front of everybody during an eclipse when everyone's looking right up and even crossing in front of the eclipse. It's not like that was unplanned. That's not just a coincidence that a plane flew in front of the sun right as it was eclipsing and that it happened to be spraying something and really low for a plane. None of that's a coincidence, and it's okay if you think it is. I'm not bothered. It's okay if you think this is kind of a really out there um, eclipse uh, recap to be talking about chemtrails, because I don't even have a whole lot of knowledge about what the fuck chemtrails are. I mean, I'm sure there's more out there. There's knowledge on everything, and it's accessible if you look for it. 
But what's important to me is that I am ready to let go and disconnect from the part of myself that is connecting to these, I guess the best word for them is sorcerers, the people that try to manipulate large groups of humanity and control them for power and stuff. Um, the disconnect from them by stopping to, you you know, no longer having a dependency on the structures that they create to be in power, which is money. So, of course, I'm not going to be able to just do that instantaneously. I don't think I've quite achieved the level of consciousness where I could just, like, quit my job and stop paying my bills and uh, somehow make all that work in a way that's not extremely uh, gnarly for my family. But, you know... To an extent, I wonder if that's really the answer because the universe does seem to provide everything that you need right when you need it as long as you are trusting and not in fear. That's one of the big things that I came out with, uh, which is a, you know, an ex- a lesson that you have to learn over and over again, so it's not like it's the first time. But I really learned about how fear itself is the thing that causes us to get hurt. There would be a bunch of times throughout the weekend, actually, where I would start getting into a thought program where I was worrying about something or having a little bit of like a fear that something was going to go wrong in some way. And there's always like something minor and silly to be even worrying about. Nothing like major fears like phobia, phobias, just goofy little things. And they would distract me because I would be giving attention to the thought instead of just being present and going, oh, that's not a relevant thought right now. I should focus on walking and carrying the shit I'm carrying. (laughs) That's... And so, of course, I would do something like run into a sign with my face or uh, because I was looking down or distracted, not even looking ahead somehow, you know, because like I can literally walk and be so in my thoughts that I don't even see the world in front of me and I'm just on autopilot. Or uh, one time I pinched my finger pretty in a pretty good way on the uh, hinges of a lawn chair I was carrying because I had some weird unnecessary thought that I followed. So all of these little things that happened that I'm describing because there were tons of them and I only gave a couple examples but they were and I think I even talked about this with Nathan but they were all just stuff that I needed to um, experience so with and there weren't really any big consequences I just needed the experiences so that I could correlate that to the thinking pattern and just know that I don't need to be in that kind of a thought pattern I can just flow in the moment that I'm in and focus on what I'm doing and focus on being present for the people around me and um, not being in those moments of worry, anxiety, and fear is what's going to keep me safe and protected against the things that I'm fearing. Because basically when you worry or have a fear, you're you're sitting out of prayer for the, the thing that you don't want and actually calling it in with that. It's like a negative form of prayer. And prayer is something that I actually utilized quite a bit this weekend in a non a non religious sense, a non theological sense. There's just a way that you can actually use the concept of prayer in an hopefully unselfish way. I believe that if what you're calling for to the universe or to God or to your higher self dimension, all those things are kind of different ways of saying the same thing. If what you're calling on is just something that's for the good of others or for the greatest good for the the all whether or not that even directly involves yourself I think those are the kind of prayers that really empower the world and are important and if we can replace our negative thoughts with those kind of thoughts replace our judgmental thoughts with those type of positive uplifting little prayers it's like a whole transformation will take place if we collectively do that uh Whether or not you think that you actually tap into the power of some deity or some divinity that's existing and creating all of this by praying to it, you do connect yourself to the intention by making the statement with the prayer. Whatever metaphysical power your thoughts have that vibrates outward and creates and manifests reality, whatever you believe on that subject, it almost isn't relevant in, in this because you can know for certain that your behavior is going to change based on the thought patterns that you're reinforcing because we all know that so all you got to do is make replace the negative patterns and programs with the the prayers and the good intentions and or just with awareness you don't need like you just start with awareness just whenever you have the negative thought go oh there's that cancel that 
just say cancel. <laughs> like, oh, I wonder what Billy's going to say because uh, I, di- I didn't show up at the spot that we were going to meet at because something happened and, oh, no, I'm just so worried that he's going to be mad at me. No, dude, Billy's fine. He, he wound up exactly where he was supposed to do, I, where he was supposed to be. I don't know who Billy is. I'm just giving an example. So when that comes in and you're like, oh, no, I, I'm going to let somebody down. I'm going to do something wrong. Just go cancel. Just say cancel. <laughs> and that'll do it. Uh, just prevent it from resonating within. And that's probably a good key step towards what what I was hoping to achieve for myself. And I know that's not like really impossible to make the this kind of shift in one instant like it's a gradual progression like everything else but what I was hoping to achieve for myself and hopefully um, plant seeds and others this weekend in my interactions was creating cultivating unconditional love for all being all life in myself to the point where I no longer even have to quite struggle to keep it activated but kind of what I learned was that it's actually a constant balancing act and you can stay switched on to your synchronicity and to being there for others and helpful for others totally but it's never going to be some magical switch that happens inside you and now you're a perfect enlightened being that always expresses compassion and love only by choosing that in every moment will that be the truth so that was, uh, and I kind of knew that, you know, there's no like, there's no date, no astrological alignment that could ever instantaneously transform us. But I think the cosmos does send us energy in certain moments and help us to make shifts whenever the time is right. And this eclipse was definitely that type of time. It was, everybody was really growing together I saw I saw a lot of faces that I've never seen out at events like this before Uh, I know that they haven't been out to events like this before and the energy was completely infectious I definitely either hugged too many sweaty tripping people or somehow had my my frequency uh, raised and elevated to a psychedelic state throughout the night um, last night on Sunday night especially but really the whole time it was quite amazing um i was seeing energy in a way that i've never consciously been aware of it before so that was really cool and i got a new staff that has a selenite on the end of it it's like a bamboo spear with a selenite tip which is super cool uh i use that to do a lot of clearing work because selenite is a crystal that is able to dispel negative vibrations that are uh in in areas or in someone's field so I kind of just like jab the spirit people and have the intention to help them uh, clear and release negative energy and I definitely noticed it was able to perk people up and help people that were tired because empathic people when they're in a really high vibrational (laughs) environment like a place where there's thousands of people and some of them are on catalysts and the vibes are just really strong anyway because it's it is the darkening of the sun and all of that um empathic people especially they absorb a lot of the energy that's coming out of people and there was definitely um people's negative energy was coming out but not in a way where people were getting stuck in it it was just stuff like what i was talking about with my having little little hiccups in my getting you know hit little problems with uh dropping things and locking keys into things and you know getting little tiny non-serious boo-boos because of not paying attention and not being present everybody was going through their own versions of that and so yeah the empathic people were picking up and absorbing and helping others release that stuff because they just do that naturally uh, a lot a lot of humans are that way they're open and loving their hearts are open um, but not everybody has a strong energy hygiene practice i've noticed and uh, that's why I talk about this a lot. And crystals, uh, burning sage, selenite crystals, meditation, grounding yourself with the earth by having your uh, bare feet on the ground. Those are all really good ways to release that built up energy. If you're starting to feel you know, more tired and more fatigued, then 
feels like you should when you're in a situation like especially a music festival or just from interacting with other people in general. If you're starting to feel drained, it's a you really ought to do something uh, for your energy and help the stagnant energy move. Uh, whether that's you need to just go to sleep or because you naturally will clear some of this while you're sleeping. Uh, or you need to, um, whether it's that or you need to just do some sort of actual energy clearing practice, whatever it is for you, then uh, why not try doing that regularly? Why not try doing that whenever you want to not feel um, hostility towards someone that you had an argument with or um, just not want to feel drained in general, I guess. I I was uh, definitely experiencing big energy shifts in people whenever I would help them clear that but the more of us are doing it intentionally, regularly, the less any of us have to do it for uh, spaces or for each other. That's kind of what it means when they say many hands make light work. So if we're all keeping our energy flowing and clear and not holding on to uh, negative emotions and and paying attention to whenever that buildup is actually occurring because it does happen. I mean. It's just a matter of paying attention. A lot of us have no idea why we feel good or bad in any moment, why we feel energized or not energized. That's part of the path is the self-awareness aspect. It's a really important part of it. So um, let's see. I don't know what else to talk about here. Uh, I mean, lots of stuff happened. I ran into so many of my beautiful friends. And like I said, everybody was going through these type of really big downloads and uploads and releases all together. And I guess I'm just really grateful that I was able to be a part of it. I'm grateful to the Native American community and the elders who held space in that in that campground and um, put so much attention into the event and attention during the event. I really think that the elders, uh, the medicine men that were present, are responsible for keeping the storms at bay at several different times throughout the festival. So thank you. T- to the thank you to the everyone that projected intention and energy at those big clouds and got them to disperse because it was really something to see it i believed it would be uh i believe the weather would hold up and it would be fine of course the entire time and it's nice to see that because sometimes festivals can be thrown off by weather really easily and uh you know not that rain is a bad thing but when you have storms and like wind and knocking tents down and it's just a bit of a distraction. <laughs> it's not that it's the worst thing in the world, but it's great whenever you can just stay clear. So um, really grateful for how everything unfolded this weekend. And um, there's probably a lot more to say, actually. Uh, I'm very interested to see what the next 40 days will bring. There's supposedly a stellar alignment occurring on the 23rd of September which is 40 days after today, where as the sun moves out of uh, Virgo, which it's going to be in next, into the next sign, on the dawn of that day, on September 23rd, when the sun rises in Virgo, or is born out of the Virgin, as the esoteric doctrine would say, at that point there will be a 12-planet and star alignment above the crown of Virgo. So it's kind of, I need to do more research on this to make sure I'm not just like completely wrong about this, but this is the information that I've come into on a, and I, like I said, there's no reason to ever put faith in a certain date that everything's gonna change instantly on that date. But it is cool to think that in the stars right now, it could be interpreted that we're going through a shift that represents the return of the sun in to the world, the sun god, you could call it, which is another way of saying Christ consciousness or (coughs) unity consciousness of that unconditional love that I was talking about wanting to um, manifest into my heart on a permanent basis. And so uh, it'd be cool if we all prayed for that to be what's coming. And if we all gradually stepped into our roles as creators and take responsibility for our creations wherever possible and learn what we can from them and uh, release that which no longer serves us in our creations and uh, hold space for one another and clear the negative vibration in the field where we can, when we can, and practice good hygiene in that sense so that everyone around us has a higher potential to also grow and evolve 
and we can make this journey to the future together and the future is actually just the present moment that's what we're returning to and yeah the present moment the present moment is where we're at we're no longer afraid because fear is basically a form of living in the past or the present and yeah we're going to release that we're all going to be back in the present moment together more and more um as this journey continues and thank you for being on this journey with us and we we all love you we all appreciate you i especially appreciate you and your energy and your attention helps me grow and i hope that in uh, some small way our experiences help each other so um much love to you all and i'll get back to driving now that i'm out of this traffic i mean i've been kind of driving fast for a while now but it seems like maybe i should pay full attention because that's what i'm <laughs> that's what my instincts are telling me so i'm gonna hop off and um that's it for this episode of interverse bye bye